many years ago now, I contracted with a retired art professor, Francis Baptist, to teach me how to draw, and that he did. But he also insisted that if I was to learn how to draw, if I was going to become an artist, I needed to understand art and art history. And so I got a crash course in art history. And not just painting, but sculpture, opera, dance. And he was intent on communicating a question for me. What is the artist in all those media trying to communicate to you? What do you see? What do you hear? What do you feel? And as I focused on that question, I began to see art differently. And not only art, but the world around me. And one of the particular places that question impacted my life was how I approached scripture. What do I see? What do I hear? What do I feel? What's the writer trying to communicate to me? And nowhere did that have a more profound effect than as I read John's Gospel. It was not one of my favorites. But suddenly, I began to understand what John was trying to do. John was trying to lead the church as it moved into the future. With those things that are critical for the church to remember. And in particular, those things which the church can easily forget. And so as we as church gather these next few weeks to ponder the sixth chapter of John's Gospel, let us enter into that with that question. What is John trying to say to us? as the church today? Or to put it in a more spiritual context, what is God trying to communicate to us through John's gospel? Chapter six begins with a very familiar story. All four gospels have a version of it. It is the feeding of the multitudes. A multitude gathers to come to Jesus for healing, to hear his teaching, but it's getting late. And Jesus asks the question, who's going to feed these folks? And the, and the disciples start going into panic because they don't have anything. They don't even have enough money to send to McDonald's. And a little boy steps up with a couple of fish and some loaves of bread. And Jesus says, that's enough. He takes it, he breaks it, he blesses it, and he gives it out to the people. And there's not only enough, but they're leftovers. It's tempting to focus on the miracle. But there's more to it than that. The first thing you notice is that it's the Passover. This meal is not just a feeding of the hungry. It has a direct connection to that sacrifice that will be made on the cross in John's gospel, the Passover lamb. It is, in essence, a foretaste of the Last Supper. Chapter six in John's gospel is Jesus' discourse on Holy Communion or the Eucharist. And over the next few weeks, John will continue to unpack the different facets of what that meal is, is all about for the church, what we need to be reminded of. But first and foremost, as we look at this meal, it is that sense that it is a meager offering that is enough to feed the multitudes. And as we come to the table with all our needs, with all our hungers, with all our emptiness, 
we are reminded that it may be but a piece of bread and a sip of wine, but it is enough to sustain us in our weariness and to restore our joy. It is enough to keep us going as the people of God until next we gather, whether it is the next day, the next week, or the next month. It is enough. God will provide all that we need to sustain us in our life's journey. In essence, this is bread for the journey. It is enough to keep us going. And that's an important message, not only in talking about the Eucharist, but in talking about our daily life. We live today in a culture of scarcity. We love to tout how we might not have enough, politically, economically, in our homes, in our schools. It won't be enough. We're, we're going to run out. That's what drives so much of the fear we have. And if it's not, an, if we don't worry about not having enough, then we should be worried about those that have more than we do. It's a not so subtle message these days. And it is in the midst of that that Jesus reminds us that God will provide all that we need. It may not be all that we want, but it will be all that we need. It will be enough to sustain us, to feed us. As John so poignantly drives this piece home, and there even is that little warning in John's gospel at the end of this where the disciples get in that whole discourse about what just happened about the bread and the crowd wants to make Jesus the bread king. That Jesus says, uh-uh, I'm not the dispenser. You need to come together to be fed and nourished. It's not bread on demand. It is an offering from God. A gift of grace. And this will be tough as the storms allude to at the end of the story. It will be a stormy life because the world wants more. And we know that's not the answer. By driving home this piece of it is enough. John opens the door for us then later in the gospel when we come to that last supper of Jesus and his disciples. That the focus is not on bread and wine. There's barely even a table. The focus is on the washing of feet and the command to go and do likewise. To love our neighbor as God has first loved us. And so we who gather at the table to be fed are now sent into the world to be instruments of God's grace and healing and reconciliation and restoration. In essence, we who have received the bread of life are now sent into the world to be the bread of life for the world. That the world may come to know in, with, and through us the grace of God. And so we conclude our time together each week with that announcement to go in peace and serve the Lord. Or as I prefer, go in peace to serve and love God 
and our neighbor.